the true ultra-rich operate behind the scenes away from the public. And with such vast power and secrecy, they can get away with anything. From starting wars, promoting slavery, to mock human sacrifices and smuggling kilograms of cocaine, here are the most depraved crimes of the ultra-rich. beginning with the Rothschild's crimes. As one French journalist claimed, there is but one power in Europe, and that is Rothschild. Now their dynasty dates back as far as the 17th century, where they built a vast fortune over the span of centuries, thanks to their banking business and vast array of assets. However, the name Rothschild would rise to infamy during the Napoleonic era. Now at one point in history, the Rothschilds seemed to be heroes for England. They were the economic protectors of the population, and as the Battle of Waterloo loomed and Napoleon was starting to conquer the world, the British government would rely more and more on the Rothschilds for support. In fact, from 1813 to 1815, Nathan Meyer Rothschild played a crucial role in nearly single-handedly funding the British war effort, whilst also coordinating the payment of British financial subsidiaries to their allies. However, whilst this all seemed great, the Rothschilds were of course not a charity. For centuries they had developed a reputation for being immoral, and doing everything they could to grow their fortunes. And this all became apparent when it was slowly discovered that they weren't just funding the king, they weren't just supporting England and fighting for justice, they were also equally funding Napoleon just at the exact same time, making bank from both sides. It was a classic Rothschild strategy to make bank, where they would encourage war between nations and then profit from both of the governments. But one thing they hadn't done was scam the population, at least not yet. So eventually as this war came to a close, the Rothschilds wanted to cash in even more. One man would travel straight from the battlefield to London, all at an incredible speed, and his whole objective was to tell Nathan Rothschild that England had won the war. This man was so quick that he arrived 48 hours before the king's messengers even arrived. And now you see, before this battle, Rothschilds were always wealthy, but they weren't close to controlling the world. However, this would soon change. Because you see, while London wasn't aware of the news, Nathan Rothschild would dump all of his stocks and bonds in the stock exchange, and by doing this, everyone then thought the market was about to nosedive, as the only reason Nathan would do this seemed to be because England lost the war, so everyone and the dog sold everything before the economy crumbled. But this was all part of the Rothschild family's plan, as Rothschild agents then secretly bought up all of these discounted stocks, and so then fast forward a few days and the news eventually broke to the public. England had in fact won, and so prices in the stock market market skyrocketed, and in that moment, the Rothschild family had more money than you could possibly imagine. Money that could buy out any government in the world. And so it was no surprise that with this fortune came the need for more power. First they would develop deep connections with the Vatican, buying up religious leaders at the time, but also other kings around Europe. For example, when King Leopold held a conference to colonize the Congo, he needed financial backing because his plan was to make the Congo a personal colony of slaves, where children and men would be forced into making ivory and rubber in one of the cruelest, most capitalistic experiments the world has ever seen. This was so evil that the Congolese population went from being 30 million to just 8.5 million people after King Leopold's reign. And yet all of these products seemed to profit the Rothschilds. You see, all these factories were funded by Rothschilds. All the slaves of this colony were fueling their empire, as well as the pockets of King Leopold. And so it's becoming clear in this period that the Rothschilds seemed to have more power than kings. So then why don't we really hear about this family anymore? Well, you see, after World War II, it was thought that the Rothschilds family dynasty completely collapsed, with Louis Rothschild being kidnapped by secret police in Nazi Germany. The bail for his release cost half a billion dollars in today's money. But this wasn't the only hit to the family's wealth. All of their wealth seemed to be stolen by governments, and the family's house of cards came tumbling down. Or did it? Because to everyone else looking, it seemed like this was a very cunning scheme to save the Rothschilds' public image. Back in the 1800s, people hated the Rothschilds. They were funding and promoting wars. They were profiting from human misery and controlling all of the wealth the world had to offer. How could anyone like this family that was using all their power to extort the population and control governments? So being able to hide behind this image of falling down under the Nazi regime seemed like the perfect way to pull away from the public limelight. But people weren't fooled by this. While she may not hear much of them today, it is widely speculated that they have a huge influence in the IMF, World Economic Forum, and many national governments. But all of this is very hard to prove. However, what can be proven is their political connections that remain today. Like during the Cambridge Five scandal at the height of the Cold War, when four British spies were discovered to be double agents. And yet when one of these agents was interrogated, he reported that there was a fifth agent that had gone missing. And so this prompted a deep investigation by MI6 and government agencies 
in the West, until one Australian journalist claimed to have found the fifth agent, an agent that was working on both sides of the Cold War for profit, and according to his research and many others, this agent was Lord Victor Rothschild, the great-grandson of Nathan Rothschild, as it was discovered that while he attended Cambridge, he was great friends with two of the Cambridge Four that were also double agents, with Victor Rothschild also being a former spy for Britain in World War II. Not only this, but due to his family's huge influence, it wasn't hard to see that with all his political connections with the Rothschilds and world governments, that he would in fact be a perfect double agent. As by studying his great-great-granddad Nathan Rothschild, it's clear that this wasn't that outlandish. I mean, Nathan Rothschild had made a fortune by playing both sides in the Napoleonic Wars, and it also seemed like the perfect way for the Rothschild family to influence politics, and thus add even more fortune to the Rothschild Empire, by using their political political connections to determine economic events. I mean, even today, the Rothschild influence in politics is ever present. In fact, some of them have even recently served on advisory councils for presidents, namely Lynn Forrester de Rothschild, who was an active secretary of the Energy Advisory Committee for the United States under Bill Clinton's leadership whilst also being a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the Institute for Strategic Studies, and the Foreign Policy Association. And this is all the stuff that's public, as no one will ever know the true scale of the Rothschild's political influence in current world events today. With the Rothschild's powerful connections, they were bestowed an endless array of art. In fact, the family claims to have done more than anyone else to amass such a huge collection of valuable art, with their art collection being accrued over the span of centuries. In fact, their art collection is worth untold millions a day, as the art market has just had a record-setting year. In the last year alone, Barron's report that art prices at auction rose at an average rate of 29%, while traditional investments and investors had their worst year since the 2008 financial crisis. However, today's sponsor allows you to invest like the Rothschilds in art by giving you access to a million dollar blue chip contemporary art, all for a fraction of the cost. Last year, Masterworks paid out over $25 million in total to their new investors. And when you look at their results, it's easy to see why. Nearly 700,000 people have signed up so far, but my subscribers can skip the waitlist by using the special link in the description below. But interfering in politics is only one of the ways these families control the world, as it's much more effective to go directly to the source and actively shift public opinion towards your needs by controlling the flow of information. And nobody does this better than the Murdoch family. They're the second family on our list because of how deep their crimes go against society, owning one of the largest media empires in history, being catalyzed by one man in particular, Rupert Murdoch. Now, Rupert Murdoch had always started from wealth, inheriting his father's Australian newspaper business. Learning the lessons and tactics that his father used to dominate the Australian markets, Rupert Murdoch would expand internationally, eventually taking majority control of Australia's newspaper industry, and then just the entirety of Australian media, controlling 59% of Australian newspapers, 40% of television revenues, and 90% of the main radio licenses. And one of the main tactics behind this huge growth was sleaze. You see, Rupert's main tactic was to turn everything he touched into a scandal factory. He's the father of the modern tabloid. Whatever his reporters had to do, illegal or not, they did get a story. But Murdoch didn't just want Australia, he wanted the world. He was the master of finding monopoly loopholes and he used these ruthless tactics to massive effect. Using his vast fortunes to control Fox, the New York Post, the Sunday Times, the Times, the Wall Street Journal, and just so many countless other news organizations. I mean, once in 1990, he borrowed from over 140 different banks to finance a Sky Takeover deal. And he could always take these risks because he was in control. Murdoch had a chokehold on the politicians. He knew all of their dirty secrets. And by controlling the majority of the press, left, right, and center, it meant that he could then weaponize public opinion, as no elected official could ever touch him and they still haven't today. You never see any politicians even criticizing him. Even when he was literally caught letting his reporters hack into phones and buy information of drug smugglers. Now we know how deep the roots of illegal journalism went at the news of the world. The hackers, including investigator Glenn Mulcair here, weren't working in secret. They weren't rogue reporters. The paper's middle managers, the desk editors, knew it was going on, as did Andy Coulson even while editor of the paper. It'd always be brushed under the rug. And so it's no surprise that the media would always stop talking about his scandals. I mean, it took Australia until 2020 to launch an investigation into whether Murdoch did in fact control their media. One quick scathing report later, and the problem was just then completely solved, even though nothing actually changed. And he still controls all of the media today buying up all the new generation media outlets, even anti-establishment media outlets like Vice are now under the thumb of Rupert Murdoch. However, there are some worrying signs for the family. As the news moves more online and independent, and TV and print start to die a slow death, we might start to see Murdoch's iron grip on the media start to wane. 
I mean, Rupert Murdoch himself is over 90 now, and his sons are currently waging this medieval secession crisis over his dying empire, with one of the Murdoch sons being allegedly pushed into a piano by his wife, breaking his back and nearly killing him aboard their 140 foot yacht. And with the recent Fox lawsuit and the company losing $700 million, it seems like the house of cards of the Murdoch family is now starting to fall. But whilst Murdoch may be on his way out, the media isn't the only way that elite families hold on to power. They gain a lot of power and wealth through playing the system in a way that only establishment elites have the ability to. I mean, just look at George Soros, for example. He's the third on our list because of his expertise in profiting off the suffering of countries. He's been a major player for decades after his first hedge fund and institutional wealth gave him the tools of power. But Soros isn't just any hedge fund manager. He's built his career by betting on the collapse of entire economies. But sometimes he's not just betting. In fact, he's actively causing the crisis to profit off it. With one of the most famous examples being when Soros broke the Bank of England after he short sold $10 billion worth of pounds during the Black Wednesday currency crisis. It all began with a vulnerability in the UK's economy. As the UK was easing into a recession, inflation was rising and the pound fell in value. Things weren't looking good. The golden age of the 80s was fading into the distance and a huge recession was looming. So the UK government tried to tie their economy to Germany's by setting up a fixed exchange rate with the whole goal of this being to stop inflation. But it really didn't. And while Germany remained strong, the UK just got weaker and weaker, but they still had to keep the exchange rate the same, which meant that the Bank of England had to buy more and more UK currency to keep the value up. And so enter George Soros. He was watching all of this with glee. He understood how truly weak the pound was and he was going to exploit it to the max. You see, George Soros realized that by short selling the pound, he could then bet against the entire UK economy and country, a country and population that was already struggling. And he would do this by buying billions of Reichsmarks to buy pounds. Because of the forced exchange rates, this would put massive pressure on the pound. And so as the years went by and the recession got worse, Soros would then bet more and more against the pound, depleting its value until the Bank of England would prop it back up again. This went on for about two years, with Soros and other hedge fund managers trying to ruin the UK economy from behind the scenes, with the Bank of England doing everything they could to prop up the economy, increasingly betting on the pound. But then eventually the bubble popped, and in one final push, Soros bet billions of dollars against the pound. And by this point, the UK just couldn't take it anymore, causing the pound to fall by 9.5% despite all the attempts by the Bank of England to keep it afloat. And because of this, the economy would collapse, and the average person in the UK became significantly poorer for years to come, weakening the UK's position in the world dramatically all to make Soros over a billion dollars in profit. Yes, he had literally pushed the country over the edge, made millions of people's struggling lives even worse, and made over a billion doing it. Now, of course, some of the fault obviously lies with the UK government and the Bank of England, but that's not really the root of the problem. The real issue here is that Soros was both partially causing and profiting off the downfall of millions, and all just for a small percentage increase to his massive fortunes. So what does Soros use this money for? Well, like all of these people, it's to push his own political ideals. In fact, Soros has put millions into politics for years, being the number one donator to the Democrat 2020 campaign, just in front of Sam Bankman fried pushing the woke corporate leftist agenda that all of his friends in the World Economic Forum and BlackRock promote. The UK wasn't the only country that was poorer because of Soros. In fact, he was the main short seller of the Thai bat in 1998 as well, causing it to crash and spiraling the whole Asian economy into crisis, doubling his $1 billion bet against the Thai government all at the expense of the people's standard of living. So then this begs the question, what is Soros actually using this money for? Why is he ruining the lives of entire populations for profit? And why did he need to add any more to his vast fortune? Well, there's a simple reason for this. He wants to push his own political ideals. In fact, Soros has put millions into politics for years, being the number one donator to the Democratic 2020 campaign. And this wasn't something new. For decades, Soros has built himself into being a political titan, all off of the back of his predatory economics. For example, he was the main supporter of the Obama and Hillary campaigns throwing hundreds of millions at super PACs and campaign funds. But over time, this has just ramped up even more, with Soros even throwing $128 million at the most recent American midterms. But the majority of Soros' political control stems from his, quote, charitable projects, like, for example, his Open Society Foundation, now through this organization, Soros has funneled billions into the non-profit, where he can then legitimately push his agenda across the globe, all while hiding behind the front of charity. And by hiding behind charity, Soros can then legitimize and perpetuate his position of power, while also helping his public image as the billionaire defender of the people. And this organization is no joke. It works very closely with both the EU and the World Economic Forum, working with these giant intergovernmental organizations to develop a new world, a world of billionaires and their subjects, 
who should be grateful for the scraps thrown their way. And Soros' sons are then set to inherit his influence and connections, as one of his sons, Jonathan, manages his own private investment fund, a great way to continue Soros' legacy. And another of his sons, Alexander, manages the charitable side of the business. And so if they keep their fortune relatively intact, the Soroses are looking at centuries of power at the top. But how do families even stay at the top for generations? We need to understand another way that they maintain their power, through building very secret connections. And this is all just part of the process and how the billionaire elite maintain their power in society. But then this begs the question, how do these families even get good connections with governments, politicians, world leaders, and celebrities? Well, billionaires do this by creating their own secretive club of elites. And really the only way to join these secretive societies is to be born into these secretive families. Now the pipeline begins in elite schools, but the most pivotal stage starts at college or university. And this is where the real connections are made through shadowy secret societies like the infamous Skull and Bones Club at Yale, where 15 people from each class at Yale are selected for initiation, which involves secret rituals and divulging your deepest secrets to the other members. The room at agreement involves signing away a portion of your earnings in return for connections and power, and this ensures these ruling elites are kept in line. All of their friends and connections in upper society know their secrets now, and they know everyone else's. Some members of Skull and Bones, otherwise known as the Brotherhood of Death, include both Bushes, former President Taft, and a whole slew of Americans elites like John Kerry. I mean, just look at this interview with both George Bush and John Kerry, where they were both asked about their participation in the society. You were both in Skull and Bone, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are going to go wild. I'm sure they are. I don't know. I haven't seen the web. Number 322? <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, he's not the nominee. And, uh, but, uh, look, I look for you. Both were members of Skull and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much because it's a secret. <laughs> Is there a secret hand? Immediately after being asked this question, they would both move on almost instantly, after an uncomfortable non-answer. Which poses some really eerie questions, that during the 2004 presidential election, the public was forced to vote between one Skull and Bones member and another Skull and Bones member. It makes you question, who's really pulling the strings here? It's all done by these nepotistic family secret societies. Now some of these secret societies can go much further, actively organizing twisted sexual rituals to create ties between the ruling classes, like for example, the Bohemian Grove. Now this sounds like a conspiracy here, but hear me out. Bohemian Grove is a secluded and highly secure section of Californian Redwood Forest, where all the most powerful people in the world gather to hold secret meetings and depraved initiations. One of these is the Cremation of Grace, where the members of Grove wear robes and light a torch under a 12 meter tall owl, an owl god called Moloch. Other recorded footage from the secret society shows mock human sacrifices and ancient Babylonian customs. The symbolism here is supposed to represent burning away your cares and conscience for the outside world, enabling members to fully embrace the cult like Grove. And then this opening ceremony begins months of copious drinking and secretive networking between elites. So he went and snuck in to this place where like former presidents go. There's yeah. a photograph of, it's uh, Ronald Reagan with Herbert Walker Bush and a couple other people all standing around. And it's like, these are the people that used to hang out at this place and they would put on robes and they would worship an owl god, an owl god and they would burn an effigy. And they're playing, and, and Alex snuck in and made video footage of this shit. And then no one's denying that it's real. This really did happen. Everyone who's anyone is a member. From the Bushes, Nixon, Tony Blair, Margaret Thatcher, Bill Gates, all the way to Clint Eastwood. And so it's clear that the Bohemian Grove, like all these other secretive societies, run on a system of institutionalized nepotism. Members of already elite families and dynasties are then inducted into a great exclusionary family, where they can then connect with each other to maintain their positions in society and extend their grips on power. And by using these gross rituals and shared debauchery, this then ties the people together, creating a shared secret that nobody would ever dare break. But their decadence pales in comparison to the next family on this list, the Saudi royal family. Our fourth family is the most powerful of them all because of their massive wealth and domination of their country. Now these are the real richest people on the planet, with some estimates putting their total wealth over two trillion dollars. And the man who controls it all is Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. Now for his own personal wealth, it's pretty clear he's the richest man on the planet, owning a 500 million dollar yacht just for starters, which is only one ship in his fleet of luxury yachts. He also owns the most expensive house in the world, a massive French chateau on the outskirts of Paris, which he bought for 300 million. 
In fact, when Obama went on a diplomatic mission, people were astounded to see that he had gold-plated tissue boxes at one of his many palaces. And he's relatively new to all this power as well, only coming to the throne in 2017. But to maintain his position at the top and secure his family's future like all of these other families, he would start to purge his political rivals. Infamously, he rounded up 200 billionaires, princes and magnates and imprisoned them at a hotel, all because of their political opinions. And then he held what's now called the Night of Beating, where they were tied up and beaten and forced to liquidate their fortunes. As common in corrupt regimes, the purges were then marketed to the people as an anti-corruption crackdown. And in lots of ways, this is true, as his rivals were very corrupt. But once you hear about what's going on behind closed doors, you'll realize they all are. I mean, it's an open secret that Saudi royals don't have to follow the strict religious laws that they enforce, as revealed by a leaked diplomatic memo describing the scene. Consulate officials who attended the royal party found that it was swarming with working girls as well as there being massive amounts of alcohol. Cocaine and hashish are also common at these parties. I mean, you can tell it's a huge problem by the fact that Saudi princes have been caught smuggling literal tons of cocaine multiple times. In 2015, Prince Abdul Musin was arrested in Lebanon after authorities found him in possession of over two tons of amphetamines, cocaine and other drugs. Or like in 2005, when another member of Saudi royalty was caught smuggling two tons of cocaine from Colombia to France, all in his taxpayer private jet. He was then able to use diplomatic immunity to flee to Saudi Arabia, avoiding a single day behind bars for something which usually carries the death penalty in Saudi Arabia. In fact, the Saudi government has the third highest execution rate in the world, almost doubling just the past six years. And this is really the crux of the problem here. Whilst enjoying the finest luxuries in history, the Saudi family have tightened their iron grip on the people, as anyone who criticizes the Saudis is then beaten, imprisoned or worse. Especially when anyone points out the Saudis' real lifestyle. The assassination of Jamal is the most infamous example of this. When the journalist was ambushed by 15 men in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, he was then strangled and disposed of. But the assassins were sloppy, and hard evidence of the brutal act surfaced soon after. And this was deliberate, to warn anyone criticizing the Saudi royal family who's really in charge. And then predictably, the only result was a show trial of some low-level participants. Despite the CIA releasing intelligence showing the Crown Prince's involvement in the plot, the US could never afford to include them in their sanctions, as the Saudi royal family is just too powerful to stop. And it's the reason why our last two families are losing their grip on power. They are quite literally above international law. But this level of decadence and control isn't sustainable in the long run. It's a process that's old as history. Something that Confucius called the mandate of heaven, or more simply, the approval of the universe. The cycle begins with a new set of rulers rising out of a period of chaos. These self-made rulers are generally virtuous and rule for the people's benefit. They have a mandate of heaven, because the universe and the people are generally happy with their lives. However, over time, the elites that inherit their positions at the top start taking it for granted to become more decadent and corrupt, just like the families we've talked about today. And then when the elites start losing touch with the people they rule over, the society starts to crumble around them. Eventually, they become too weak to rule effectively, and the country falls into chaos until a new set of people take control and start the process all over again. And for a good example of how this plays out in the modern world, we don't need to look further than Sri Lanka, a country torn apart by the greed of their elites, and the home of our fifth set of oligarchs. nation -wide protests and riots have been going on for years, with most of this being caused by the severe shortages of the most basic goods. Food, fuel and electricity are scarce, business and schools are closing down, and everyone's struggling wages are only continuing to fall. But whilst most paint this crisis as a result of economics and international crisis, it's really just because of the Rajapaska family, the royal family that has ruled over Sri Lanka for decades. Whilst this family of elites have always interfered with Sri Lanka's politics, their power reached a new height in 2005, when Mahinda Rajapaska was elected president. And in a classic display of nepotism, he was quick to put close family members in the highest offices of government, like putting his brother as the defense secretary, or his other brother as the senior presidential advisor. And ever since, their two decades of rule has been full of corruption scandals and sinister schemes, including the theft of over $5 billion from the country's dwindling reserves. They even allegedly used this taxpayer money to build themselves an off-the-books private hotel. However, it's these sorts of actions that have left the country particularly ill-equipped to deal with the global recession that we're in, throwing the country into a never-ending collapse. But unlike lots of the stories we've already gone through, the people are actually fighting back, as during protests last year, thousands of Sri Lankans descended on the presidential palace, occupying it for days and forcing two successive Rajapaska presidents to leave office, completely removing this poisonous family from continuing to destroy the country from the inside. However, just across the water, there's a similar situation unfolding in India, although they're not quite as far along 
along in the cycle, but the sixth family are still facing an existential crisis of their own making. As it came out recently that the Adani Group, a family run massive conglomerate that dominates the Indian economy, was propped up by fraud. Now, it wasn't small to begin with, but over the past three years, their value skyrocketed to over 200 billion. This allowed the head of the Adani family to become the third richest person on the planet. But this massive growth was almost too good to be true, something which the Hinden Group highlighted in their scathing report on the company, as the investment firm alleged that the family had manipulated the stock market and fudged the numbers to make the company seem much more valuable than it really was, enabling them to take out massive loans to fuel their growth. Now the details are still somewhat murky, as Hindenburg Research specializes in taking companies out and exposing them in public so that they can bet against their share price and make a fortune. But what made this so sinister was the amount of influence the Adani Group has over the Indian government, and thus the country of India as a whole. In fact, Prime Minister Modi has been deeply connected to the family for decades, allowing this family to control all of India's private airports, whilst also being granted huge control of India's natural gas industry. All of this to the outrage of the Indian population, who see this crony nepotistic corruption poisoning the country from the top. I mean, it got so bad that the managing director of Adani Exports was actually arrested for evading customs tax, faking import documents, and illegal imports into the country. Not only was this criminal, but the director should have at least been fired from the company, and yet he was promoted, whilst also being forgiven by the Indian government. And this wasn't their first incident either. The Adani group has also been charged with money laundering, embezzlement of $17 billion of taxpayer money, along with multiple counts of corruption. And yet these investigations would also be blocked by the Indian government. And that's why the corruption of India by the Adani family is just unparalleled. So after the reports from the Hindenburg Research Group were released, it showed to everyone a very ugly side to the family. The Adani group really hasn't been able to refute the report's findings. A 400 page rebuttal they released failed to acknowledge the actual allegations. And then the unapologetic apology video they released just really didn't help either. With their CFO trying to wrap themselves in the Indian flag, tying his company's reputation to India's, all to take advantage of the people's patriotism. But when it came out that he was actually an Australian citizen, this really didn't pan out very well. While the verdicts are still out, the Adani group is doing everything that guilty companies tend to do, but because of their ties to the Indian government, hard evidence of their corruption could prove disastrous. They've already lost over $100 billion in their valuation, severely denting the Adani family's reputation. But just like the other families in this video, they're so entrenched in their society that a complete collapse is unlikely. Only a wider societal shift will make actual change possible.